Good morning. It's such a joy to see each of you here this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We enter into the time, the season of the year known as Advent. Now, Advent, you may not be familiar with what all that entails, but at its essence, Advent is a season of waiting. This time of year that we look back and we remember how God's people waited for thousands of years for God to send his promised Messiah. Well, that's what we celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate the incarnation that God came to earth in human flesh and that God was faithful to keep his promise. But Advent is that season of waiting where we remember just how God's people have waited in the past. We too are waiting for Christ to return. So all of that is wrapped up in this season of waiting known as Advent. We look for God who was faithful to send his son. We are waiting for him to send him once again to return to take us to be to heaven with him. So we hear our promised Messiah speak through his word in the book of Exodus this morning. Exodus chapter 15, starting in verse 1, verses 1 through 3. Exodus 15, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. This is God's holy word. Let's go to him in prayer. God in heaven, we come to you this morning praising you, exalting you, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the one true and living God. And as we think about our family of faith here at Ramah for nearly 200 years, we can say that you are truly our Father's God as well. And so we praise you. Lord, we could take all day praising you for all that you have done. But we will say with Moses and the people that you are our strength and our song. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for giving us the strength to endure everything you had in store for us this past week. Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you are our song. You are the subject of our song and you are the reason why we can sing this morning. So we do come to you prepared to sing your praises. But Lord, we praise you that you are our salvation, that after that long period of waiting, you did send your son at his first advent, his first coming. And just as you were faithful to send your son, Jesus Christ, we know that you will send him once again. He will return and we will be with you forever and ever. And because of this, we can take comfort in verse three, knowing that you are a man of war. Yahweh is your name. Lord, because you are a man of war, you will send your son to make all things right to right every wrong, to make all things new. And for that, we pray, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. We respond to God's word now by singing. So would you stand as we sing, O Worship the King. Yeah. 
As we continue to worship, listen to these words from Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 17, particularly as we reflect on the time in which the people of God awaited the Messiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. You may be seated. Let us continue to worship in song this expectation of Emmanuel, who would come and bring rest to God's people as we sing together, God rest you merry gentlemen. Savior was born on Christmas. 
save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. be to God that through the waiting that Israel did for a Savior, God answered with Jesus our Messiah. Let us stand together and read together from Revelation chapter 5 of the reign of our King Jesus. If you will read the portions that are in yellow, and I'll read the rest. In between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and the Lamb, be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Let us to worship the Lord in song, singing, Crown him with many 
Browns. seated. Thank you, choir, and Sherland, for helping lead us in music this morning as we worship the Lord. I pray that our songs this morning, and even the scriptures that we read, and then sang in response to, help point us to what's happening, or what we're reflecting on, rather, in this period of Advent. The people of God were once in distress, but then God provided for them a way to have peace. And really, as we make our way through Micah, we see a turning point today in the text of Micah. So far, we've walked through the first three chapters of Micah, Micah 1, 2, and 3. And you have probably not been super encouraged uh, by a lot of the, of the content of this book so far, except for a little bit of glimpse in chapter 2 of God is our shepherd king. But today, we have... A turning point as we look to chapter four. And so because of that, I'd like to extend my thanks to Pastor Charles for taking the, the gloom, if you will, of the first three chapters and, and, and letting me proclaim to you this glorious nature of the promise of God that we see here in Micah chapter four. As we begin to turn our attention to chapter four, I think it'd be helpful just to reflect for a moment on chapter three. So in chapter 3, we saw that Israel's leaders, their priests, 
other spiritual leaders and civil leaders sought to become wealthy through theft and through, and through greed. They ran the land through bribery. They manipulated justice in order to favor the wealthy. As we walk through chapter 3, we see the wickedness of the judges in verse 1. Verse 2 again in verse 9. We see the lesser and the weaker people being abused and oppressed. We see the Lord being absent from them altogether in verse 4. The prophets and the priests weren't leading the people rightly. They were leading the people astray. We see this in verses 5 through 7. We see the wickedness of not only the judges, but even the wickedness of the leaders in verse 9. We see blood shed. We see cannibalism. We see an ingenuine trust in God where the leaders, right after shedding the blood of their own people, turn around and somehow verbalize this ingenuine trust in God. And then in verse 12 of chapter 3, we see this judgment laid on them. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height because of the sinfulness of his people particularly in these passages the leaders the priests judgment is coming upon not only them but all of the people which leads leads the people to probably ask themselves a few questions what, what, what about Jerusalem, your holy city? What about God's promises to this city? God's promises throughout all of the Old Testament. God's promises to, to Adam. God's promises to Noah. If you were in Sunday school with Pastor Charles this morning, you looked at the covenant that God made with Noah. What about God's promises to Abraham? God's covenant with Abraham to multiply him, to make him a great nation? What about the promises given to Moses and the people as they were redeemed and delivered out of slavery in Egypt? What about the promises? They continue, they go on and on. What about the eternal reign of the seed of David that we see prophesied in the counterpart to Micah, that is in Isaiah? How could little Judah ever overcome the terrorization that would come upon them from the nations. So as this is happening to them, it's, it's, it's understanding. It's understandable why they may feel and think this way. And then comes chapter 4. Chapter 4 of Micah provides the answers to all of these questions and more. If you will, stand with me. In the honor of the reading of God's word, I'm going to only read verses 1 through 5, but we will look at the entirety of chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. In the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between many peoples, and he shall decide disputes for strong nations far away, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. May the reading of God's word be blessed. Let us pray together. Father, we are thankful for your word. Now as we spend the next few moments sitting underneath the preaching of your word, the proclamation of your word, learning from your word, not only that we would 
store up intellectual knowledge somehow, but Lord, that your word might change our hearts and minds as we reflect on your work through your people in Micah chapter four. So fathers, we give our attention to your word. Help us to have open minds, open hearts, that we might hear and understand your word and apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. In Micah chapter four, we're essentially looking at four different sections uh, in response to what we've seen unfold in chapters one, two, and three. In verses one through five, we're gonna see God's promised restoration of Zion. Not only Zion, but also the nations. That's really important for us to pick up on this morning. And then in verses six through eight, we're gonna see not only is God transforming Zion and the nations, but we're gonna see in verses six through eight how that specifically applies to the people and what transformation takes root in the lives of God's people, transforming the weak into the strong. And in verses nine and 10, and in verses 11 through 13, we see two sections that communicate the stress of God's people, but also the rescue of God's people. So in verses nine through 10, for now, God's people still have to suffer the consequences for their sin, but there's a promise of rescue. And again, in verses 11 through 13, the nations who are enacting God's judgment against his people, uh, they are the tool that God uses to, to judge his people. They don't even understand their role and what they're doing. But God, through his people, will make it clear. And so this morning, I hope we walk away from this text knowing this. Though God's people suffer, judgment of, suffer the judgment of God through the nations now, in the last days, God will restore a remnant of his people and extend grace to the nations that they may enjoy the eternal presence and glory of the Lord. Let me say that one more time. Though God's people suffer the judgment of God through the nations now, now, in the last days, God will restore a remnant of his people and extend grace to the nations that they may enjoy the eternal presence and glory of the Lord. And so let's look at this unfold throughout Micah chapter 4. It's worth noting here, Pastor Charles mentioned this uh, a couple weeks ago, perhaps last week as well, but there's a close semblance between Micah and Isaiah. Isaiah is much longer, of course, but both were prophesying at the same time in Israel and Judah. And so here we see something in the beginning of chapter 4 that mirrors almost identically what you would see in Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 5. So listen to this opening section here of Micah chapter 4. It shall come to pass in the latter days, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. In the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And it goes on from there. It still mirrors Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, even for the next verse or so. But let's start here at the beginning. There's something at the very beginning of this passage that we need to know very quickly. It says, it shall come to pass in the latter days. So now we're kind of left wondering, okay, these latter days. We, we've read chapters 1, 2, and 3. We've studied those. We know what Israel is experiencing, what Judah is experiencing now. We know what they're going to experience with the, the siege of Assyria and then ultimately exile in Babylon. And so they're left wondering, okay, when are these latter days? And for us as well, we ask the same question. When are these latter days? Have these latter days, now that we're nearly 3,000 years past this event, which took place around 700 BC, are, are these latter days, have they already taken place? Or do we still await them even today? Well, I think a comparison between this passage and the one in Isaiah would be very helpful in determining that. Not only that, but even the circumstances that we read in this passage reveal to us whether this has happened or whether it's something we're still awaiting, or perhaps a both and. Something that has happened 
but that one that we will see even fuller, more fully established in eternity. And so it shall come to pass in the latter days that what? The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. Think about the, the mountain, the house of the Lord. At this time, it was the temple mount. Right? Jesus, not Jesus yet, but we see the Israelites worshiping the Lord in the temple. Was the temple anything special to the pagan nations that surrounded them? No, it was nothing special to them. It wasn't even really that high of a place physically. And so we, we'll see a little bit later when we look over at, at verse 11, how the nations looked at Israel. Many nations are assembled against you, saying, let her be defiled, and let our eyes gaze upon Zion, we see in verse 11. They looked haughtily at God's people in the house of the Lord. It was nothing, nothing that intimidated them whatsoever, but would that always be the case? No, here God says, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. So we say highest and lifted up. We don't necessarily mean uh, geographically higher or geographically lifted up, but in its stature, in its importance. For one day, the house of the Lord, the Zion, eternal Zion, will be lifted up, and all peoples, as it says here, shall flow to it. Think about that language, shall flow to it. Typically, how does, how does something in a river flow? Does it flow upstream towards a higher, or does it usually flow downward? It flows downward. But is that what happens here? No, in here, the peoples flow to it, this place that has been established as the highest mountain. But think about this. It shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Think about who peoples are. The next verse helps us understand that. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. This is very important. Who is it that's in distress? Who is it that's about to be in even greater distress as they are sieged and thrown into exile? God's people, Judah. Is he speaking only of God's people, Judah, here that will flow to the mountain of the Lord? No, oh, he says all people. He said peoples, many nations. We'll see as we travel through the text that all peoples, all nations, all tongues, all tribes, all languages, from all people that cover the face of the earth, they will flow to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And why? That he may teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. In chapter 3, we saw a disingenuine trust in the Lord. But here, all people, nations, will flow to the mountain of the Lord and will willfully, with full assurance, trusting, not a fake trust, real trust, will walk in his paths as they are taught his ways. Notice it's a cause and effect. God will teach the people his ways, and the people in turn will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is really important for us to see. Where, where is it out of? It's out of Zion. Where? Jerusalem. So all of the peoples, all the nations, are going to flow to the mountain that is one day exalted, this mountain will be Zion, God's holy city. The word of the Lord from Jerusalem here at the end of verse 2. This is so important for us to understand. It's not just any place that God's people, all people, will flow to. It is the holy city which God has set apart. It reminds me of what we see in Luke chapter 24. If you'll turn there with me quickly. Luke 24. Luke 24, beginning in verse 44. So Jesus is 
speaking to his disciples, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that Christ, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to who? All nations. And from where? Beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. So here Jesus fulfills the promises of the prophets in so many ways. And here we already see him borrowing imagery from Micah of, of Jerusalem being the place from where the good news will be pronounced. Not just a pronouncement now for right now for evangelistic purposes, but even a pronouncement for eternity in which God will raise up his holy city, his holy mountain, and from there peoples will be drawn to it. And the prophecy is a fulfillment of what? Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy as he is throughout the Psalms and the Proverbs and the law. And so back in Micah chapter 4, verse 3. Verse 3 says, He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. This is really helpful for us to understand. Who is judging the people in chapter 3? Wicked leaders, wicked, wicked judges. Who's judging the people in chapter 4, verse 3? God. God is the judge. Look what results when God judges his people versus corrupt leaders. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Swords are weapons of warfare. With God as judge, they're no longer needed, but instead are beaten into tools for, for harvest. And again, the next line, and their spears, again, another tool for war, turned into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree. Think about what that communicates. We've seen there will be no more war with God as judge. Is there war today? This is an important question for us to ask. Is there war today? Yes. Have we seen the fulfillment of what we see here in the beginning of chapter 4 yet? No. That should be really helpful for us to understand. What time, when we say latter days, we're talking about. So in the latter days, still, so there's no war. Weapons of warfare have been turned into tools for harvest. And instead, what happens now in verse 4 is that every man sits under his vine and under his fig tree. What do the imagery of a vine and a fig tree communicate? It communicates peace. communicates prosperity and an abundance of it. Don't be mistaken that this is in any way proclaiming a prosperity gospel. This is talking about a time in the future that's not now. The vine and the fig tree portray peace and prosperity for all nations that will come to the Lord in his holy mountain. In the second half of verse 4 says, and no one shall make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. This final phrase here in verse 4 is such an important word. This isn't just anyone, like, it's not just Micah saying, hey, here's what I think. It's not borrowing from Isaiah and saying, hey, here's what I think. It's not just some man communicating something. All of these promises come from the Lord. Here it says, the mouth of the Lord of hosts. This is Lord of hosts as in the commander of his people, his army, has 
spoken. You, know, you might have heard of this, this little saying sometimes, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You ever heard that before? Yeah, it's a terrible, it's a terrible statement. Well, think about it for a moment. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Guess what? If God said it, it doesn't matter whether we believe it or not for it to be settled. God saying it alone is enough for it to be settled there. And the I believe it follows that in response to the God proclaiming his word. And not just I believe it, but we will obey it. We see in God's word in verse 5. So think about this phrase. God said it, that settles it. I believe and will obey it. Verse 5 says, for all the people's walk. This is talking about right now in this moment as Mike is writing. For all the people's walk, each in the name of its God. Think about the pantheon. Multiple gods uh, displayed there. Not real gods, of course. Little g gods. The, the image of those people, each person worshiping his own God. That's what they do now in that moment. This is what they were doing. But look what the second half of verse 5 says. But we will walk in in the name of the Lord our God forever and how long? Ever. Amen. As we think about the, the truths that we see here in verses 1 through 5, it reminds me, remember Isaiah is, is a contemporary of Micah. You'll see language identical almost throughout the prophecy of Isaiah that you find in Micah as well. But when we think about verses 3, and four, this reality that is to come that we still haven't seen yet, like a ceasing of war and a peace and a prosperity for all people. I'm reminded of Isaiah 11, 1 through 12. Would you turn there with me? Isaiah 11, 1 through 12. I'm going to emphasize verse 4 just so you can hear the, the, the connection between verse 4 and what we read in verse 3 about God judging between many peoples. Isaiah 11, 1 through 12 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So a stump, is a stump something, well, how, did, how do you get a stump? Something's cut down, right? Something's cut down, it becomes a stump. This is very much what's going to happen to God's people. They're going to be cut down by the Assyrians and sent off into exile with the Babylonians. But there will come forth a shoot from this stump, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Are we talking about a mortal man at this point? No. We're talking about the seed of David who will become the Messiah, who is the Messiah. In verse 5 says, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. Think about this for a second. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Does a wolf dwell with a lamb today? No. A wolf attacks a lamb today. A leopard lies down with a young goat. Will a leopard lie down with a young goat today? No. The leopard preys on the young goat. The calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. No, you put a fattened calf in front of a lion today and the lion has supper. And a little child shall lead them. And so in all the while you have peace between these animals that prey on one another. You have a little child just grazing among them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy where? In all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
in that day, that day, remember we're talking about latter days, and as we'll see in verse six, the last days. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations, not just Israel, not just Judah, the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. The Lord shall extend his hand, what? A first time? No, a second time. This is very helpful for us because the Lord will extend his hand a first time to his people. They're about to go into exile and the Lord will redeem them from that, deliver them from that exile, but they still have a more permanent redemption and restoration coming as we see take place here in the, in the, in the stump, in the root of Jesse. Verse 12, I'll just read one more verse and we'll get back to Micah. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And so as we go back and think about verses one through five, we're talking about a latter day that is happening sort of for the people right now, but one that will be more fully realized at the return of the Lord, the return of Christ. Look at verse six. And so now we see how God's going to call the nations to his holy mountain, how he will draw them to himself, how they will flow to the holy mountain. But here in verses 68, we will get to see what that means for the people. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. There's really important, there's two things that are really important to see in the sentence. One, he will assemble the lame. What describes these, the people that he will assemble? They're lame. What do they do to the lame and the weak? In chapter three, they oppressed them. They abused them. Here, God focuses on them and says he will assemble the lame. But here's the second, and he says that he will gather those who have been driven away. So notice these, these verbs, I will assemble. I will gather. Where will he assemble and gather? In his holy mountain. But listen to these pronouns. I will assemble the lame. And those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant. And those who are cast off a strong nation. The Lord is declaring that their current circumstance is his doing. But so will be their rescue. And so it's always important for us to understand that what they experience, what they experience is the doing of the Lord, but God who is just and who must punish sin is also just in delivering his people through sin for Christ has been the ultimate sacrifice for us, taking the ultimate punishment so that we might receive grace. And that's what's happening here for these people. And so he says in verse seven, the lame, I will make the remnant and those who are cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. From this time forth, and we see again, God puts a time on his reign. How far? Forever, or how long rather? Forevermore. Forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion. Listen to the, the word that he uses here now to describe his people, the remnant that he will restore. He calls them the daughter of Zion. Of Zion. His people are precious to him. They are his personal people. He refers to them as the daughter of Zion. Listen to how, what they can expect as they are drawn to the hill of the Lord. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, they in, Z in Zion, in the new Jerusalem, will be exalted, will be a tower, will be the highest of hills. And to you shall it come, it says. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. 
they, the people that God draws himself, share in the reign of Christ. Notice the, notice the language here that we see. O tower of the what? Flock. And earlier it talks about assembly and gathering. What do these verbs remind us of, these, these words? They remind us of a shepherd. So we see the same shepherd king progression that we saw in chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. This shepherd king pro- progression. So God as a shepherd will also be their king. And so as we reflect on these first eight verses of Micah. It's really important. Think about the contrasts with chapter three. Wicked judges, no more. Now the Lord is their judge. The lesser and the weaker being abused, no more. The lesser and weaker are now gathered, assembled, and strengthened. The Lord absent in verse four of chapter three, no more. The Lord is now present with his people in all nations that he draws to himself. We see that in verse two. The prophets and the priests were leading the people astray, but no longer now who leads the people. God leads his people. No more wicked leaders. Now it's the glorious reign of the Lord. No more bloodshed. Now we have an end of war and an end to destruction. No more fake trust in God. Now we have genuine trust in God as the people commit to walking in the ways and the paths of the Lord. And the destruction of Zion's hill that we saw in chapter 3, verse 12, no more. Now, Zion, the new Jerusalem, God's holy mountain, is exalted, and the fruitfulness and the future of his people is promised. We have great promise in verses 1 through 8 in response to what we see in in chapters 1, 2, and 3. But in these last two sections, God's people must still must still experience, for now, the suffering of their consequences, the suffering of consequences for their sin. And so we see distress here at the beginning of verse 9. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? That pain seized you like a woman in labor. The people, he says, is there no king in you? They have a king if they would call upon him, the Lord. Has your counselor perished? God would be their counselor should they submit to him. But because they have not, they experience birth pains, like a woman in labor. But it's helpful to understand that even the pains of labor are temporary. Verse 10, he tells them to writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion like a woman in labor. And he gives him three reasons to, gro- to groan. For now you shall go out of the city. They will go out from the city. They will be sent out of Jerusalem by Assyria. And they'll have to dwell, secondly, in the open country. Think about open country. Think about the Israelites in the wilderness following Egypt. It's not pleasant. But thirdly, they will also groan because they will not just go to wilderness. They will ultimately go to Babylon exile in Babylon. But remember, each of these statements of distress leads to deliverance. There it says, the end of verse 10, you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And so while most of what we've seen, what we have seen in the first eight verses of Micah chapter four are, are looking at the last days as we saw at the beginning of verse 1, in the beginning of verse 6, in that day, the latter days, the last days, we see this promise that awaits them. But even now, the Lord is extending his hand of deliverance to them in temporal ways as they await the more permanent deliverance. And in the last section, 11, 12, and 13, it begins again with distress. Now, many nations are assembled against you, saying, let her be defiled, and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. We looked at this verse earlier, the people, the nations, this is Assyria, most likely in 701 BC, about to siege Judah, Jerusalem. As, as they approach, they see nothing special. But look what God says in verse 12. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan that he has gathered them as sheaves 
to the threshing floor. What Assyria doesn't realize, and neither what Babylon understands, is, they, is that they are nothing but tools in the hand of God for him to enact his judgment against his people. I mean, ultimately, what's the end for Assyria and Babylon? Ultimately, destruction. God's people face destruction momentarily. Assyria and Babylon, they face an eternal destruction. Look, it even comes at the hand of God's people. Verse 13, arise and thresh. So we see that word thresh again. Just before, at the end of verse 12, we see that he has gathered them as sheaves. This is the nation's to the threshing floor. And now he's saying to his people, arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. It is at the hands of his own people that he will enact the threshing, the purifying process to redeem his people. For what does he do to his people? I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hoofs bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples, and shall devote their grain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. Notice at the end of this passage, who benefits? Certainly God's people are benefiting immensely. Eternal glory, eternal glorification because of their trust in God, their redemption, their deliverance, but it's all for the glory of God. Here at the end it says, you shall beat in pieces many peoples and shall devote their gain to, not themselves, their gain to the Lord. And their wealth to who? The Lord of the whole earth. All things point to the glory of God. That's why earlier I said, as a central proposition for our text, it's that he would extend grace to his people and to the nations, that they may enjoy the eternal presence and glory of the Lord. And so as we approach the end of our text, we might think, okay, well, we're not the Israelites. We're, we're the nations, really. Is there any implication that has for us as God's people now that we've been redeemed by Christ and how it connects itself to nations um, trying to overcome us as God's people? The answer is sure. Absolutely. We're in a battle. We're in a battle every day. The nations are not on good terms with the people of God, even today. We await this ultimate deliverance, but it's so important for us to understand. This was, this was very difficult for the people of Micah's time to know this. The deliverance for us comes through the hand of Jesus Christ. In John 12, 32, we'll look here lastly. Deliverance for us has already come but we haven't seen it fully. When one day we'll have perfect peace, there'll be no warfare, all will live with rich blessing. Look at verse 12, I'm sorry, chapter 12 of John, verse 32, as we see how this is inaugurated. I'm going to back up to verse 27. Let's get into it a little bit. Now is my soul troubled. This is Jesus speaking. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So how do the people flow to the holy mountain of the Lord? through Jesus, who himself was lifted up. Lifted up on the cross to die for our sins. Buried, not lifted up one time, lifted up again out of the grave, resurrected, and lifted up again, ascended to the Father, the right hand, reigning eternally, and one day will return, and one day will inaugurate this perfect peace that we read about in Isaiah 11, 
Micah 4. And so when we have troubled times, we can trust in God. And as, as the people in Micah's day, in chapter 4, verse 5 said, we will walk in the name of our Lord. It's not only a commitment to be obedient to God, it's also a confession of the rich trust that they have in God. They say, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. May we have this assurance this morning that in our distress, God has answered with Jesus, our Savior, and has brought us rescue and a promise of an eternal hope. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this morning. What a joy it is on this Advent day, a day of reflecting on the rescue that the God, that your people, God needed. It's so helpful for us not only to reflect on that, to know that you answered. You see Jesus' words in Luke 24, saying he came to fulfill these promises. And Father, we're thankful that he indeed did fulfill them. And so now as we await this time, this, this, this time of fulfillment in which Christ will return, and he will reign his, over his people in the new heaven and the new earth, Lord, let us have the same trust your people had, Micah, that we will walk your law, we will walk in your paths forever and ever. Lord, we love you. Thankful for the grace of Christ given to us. Help us to worship you and respond to you with worship in our lives, also worship in our words, worship in song, we respond to you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's stand together now and sing in response to God's word, my Jesus, I love you. And as we do that, think about the eternal hope that we have in him. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Savior art thou if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now I love thee because thou hast first loved me my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If cold on my brow if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now in 
mansions of glory and endless delight. I'll ever adore Thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with a crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Amen. I'd like to invite our ushers forward now as we continue to worship through giving of our tithes and offerings. Brother Paul, would you pray for us this morning? Amen. Thank you so much, Cheryl Ann. I want you to think with me quickly about how we've gone through our service. We began, we heard our King speak through his word, and we would like to adore our King, but we recognize that in our sinfulness, we can't draw near to our King. But we were reminded that Christ has provided redemption for us, and because of what Christ has done, we can come near the King. We can approach the King all because of the redemption given to us through Jesus Christ. And once we've been able to draw near to God through Christ, then we can actually hear God speak, which we've done through the preaching of God's word. We can actually hear his instructions to us, and now we can draw near to him in communion and prayer. So as we think of come let us adore him, let's actually do that for just a moment in a brief word of pastoral prayer. Lord, we come to you, and we wonder sometimes how can we actually 
pray for ourselves. We, as we go through Micah, we recognize that we are sinful just like your people Judah. We are sinful like the nation, sometimes far more often than we want to admit. We know that our sin keeps us from drawing near to you in prayer. Lord, we praise you because of what Christ has done. Because of what our shepherd king has done, we have communion with you, our Father. We can draw near to you. We can be faithful because Christ was faithful. So we thank you that we can draw near to you and pray for ourselves, pray for our needs as a church. And so we do that now, Lord. We are thankful that we don't have to wonder uh, like the people there in the passage that they don't know your word. We don't have to be like the nations. We know your word. We know what you have spoken and your word is enough. Lord, we're reminded today that your word is enough in times of trouble, in seasons of difficulty. You are faithful even when we are faithless. And no matter what we must endure in this life, we know that there's a better day coming, that Christ, you will return. You will make all things right, make all things new. So in that meantime, Lord, we pray that we would truly be a people of the book, that we would be people who are submitted to your word because you have said it, and that settles it. So Lord, according to your word, may we worship you well. According to your word, may we work for you well. According to your word, may we witness for you well. And Lord, according to your word, may we finish well. Individually and as a church, Lord, we do this as we go out in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever and ever. Amen. As we do prepare to go out, we uh, have a few opportunities as a church throughout this week and throughout this month, opportunities for service that I want to remind you of for just a moment. One of the many things that we do around this time of year, Christmas time, is we take out of the abundance that the Lord has given to us and we give back a small portion of that to international missions. We call that our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And that's our goal. Our goal for that this year is for $2,500. Every penny of that goes directly to missions around the world through our International Mission Board as a Southern Baptist Church. Uh, that's where that money uh, is collected and distributed to our missionaries that are serving all over the face of the earth. So if you have questions about that, I'd love to talk with you further, but I would encourage you, uh, even as you're doing all the planning for gift getting and gift giving and all of that sort of thing this time of year, I would encourage you to, to pray about what the Lord would have you to give to the cause of international missions. Uh, another way that you can give, not just around the world, but here locally, is through our angel tree. Many of you have already taken advantage of that. In fact, the tree is almost cleaned off, I think. I haven't looked at it this morning. Uh, but we do always know a few more names of people who are in need and, and would benefit from that. And so uh, if you have not had opportunity to take anything from the angel tree, uh, know that you can still do that. You can talk to Angela about that, and we will get you uh, some information even if the tree is cleaned off. Again, I haven't looked at it this morning, but I know it's getting close uh, to being empty because so many of you have, have committed to give back uh, to our neighbors around us, and we're grateful for that. If you have uh, committed to, to purchase a gift, to, to make a, a gift to those in our community, those need to be here by September 11th. Well, not September, where did that come from? December 11th, I'm so sorry. I, that's what happens when you go out of town for a week. You really don't know what day of the week it is. I apologize. December 11th. And so uh, we will give you further instruction about how we'll get those to the families and all that sort of stuff. But um, we want to get those here by that Sunday. So I believe that's two weeks from today. Um, with other things going on this time of year, you should have noticed on your newsletter this week, you'll also see out there the, a different version of that, but the calendar of all these events I'm about to tell you about, they're on a calendar. We want you to be aware of those so that you can make your plans to join us as much as possible this month of December. Uh, on December 9th, there will be a hymn sing at our house. If you love Christmas carols, uh, this will be a wonderful time for us to get together as a church and fellowship. Uh, it's whoever wants to come, you're invited to come. Uh, whatever you want to eat, bring it. We'll have uh, everybody bring appetizers, snacks, and all that. We will have a wonderful time. So we encourage you to join us December 9th, Friday night at 6 p.m. at our house uh, for a Christmas hymn sing. Uh, if you don't know where we live, I'd be glad to give you that address, but we can certainly make that available to you closer to time. And that's on Friday, December 9th. Uh, I know one Sunday school class is having a party on December 10th. December 11th, on Sunday morning, we'll have our church-wide Christmas breakfast fellowship. 
Uh, we haven't been able to do that since I've been here for various reasons, but I'm told that's something that you have done often in the past. And so uh, December 11th, there won't be any Sunday school that Sunday or the rest of the month. Uh, just to give our teachers a break and to give you time for all the other things going on at this time of year. But December 11th uh, at 9.45, we will have a Christmas fellowship breakfast downstairs in the fellowship hall. We will have a Christmas concert. Our choir will be singing. We'll have uh, special songs and ensembles and all sorts of things on uh, December 18th at 4 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. So you don't want to miss that. Our Christmas concert, Oh Come Let Us Adore Him, December 18th. Now, uh, again, no Sunday school that Sunday, just the service and the concert that afternoon. But then the following Saturday is Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, December 24th, we will have our Christmas Eve service, our lessons and carol service. Lord willing, we plan to do that in the chapel. And so that'll be a wonderful time, Christmas Eve, 4 p.m. in the chapel. And then Christmas Day, December 25th, we will also plan to have our one service, no Sunday school, Lord's Day service, December 25th at 11 a.m. there in the chapel. That's all the things to be thinking about as we look forward to the month of December. But this week, you have opportunity to gather 6 p.m. Wednesday night as we gather church in prayer during a prayer meeting this week at 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. Our choir will rehearse there in the choir room. All right, I believe that's enough announcements for one day. So as we prepare to go out, Pastor Laramie is going to lead us in one final verse as we prepare to go out, and he will dismiss us with a benediction from God's word. Let's stand together as we sing the final stanza of Crown Him with Many Crowns. <clears throat> Crown Him the Lord of Heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through Him given from yonder glorious throne to thee be endless praise for thou for us hast died be thou O Lord through endless days adored and magnified and from 2 Timothy 4 17-18 May the Lord stand by you and strengthen you so that through you the message might be fully proclaimed and all peoples hear it. The Lord will rescue you from every evil deed and bring you safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. <clears throat>